I would say Happy New Year, and so I'll say Happy New Year, but also I want to say to you Merry Christmas. Uh, you, you see, it's still Christmas. Uh, the early church celebrated Christmas for 12 days following Christmas Day. And so this is day eight, which is really neat because on today specifically, they celebrate the name of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Jesus, what a wonderful, glorious name. And we praise his name this morning. As far as announcements, uh, next Sunday we go back to normal service times. Nine o'clock worship for uh, Alliance Bible, and then life skills after that, and then for the Nazarene group, 9.30 Sunday school and 10.45 worship. And so back to that and remember that routine and, and getting back into to that routine. Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock. Yep. Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock, uh, Bible study. We'll continue looking at C.S. Lewis. And uh, so be a part of that. Next Sunday is the win women's ministry dinner that they provide once a month. It costs us $8.00. The money goes to support Backpack Blessings, which is to help uh, children. We uh, provide backpacks for eight children over the uh, school year, uh, over the weekend. And so that's what that goes to uh, support, but that will be going on next Sunday. So please remember that and plan on being a, a, a part of that. Any other announcements, Pastor Ruben, that you know about? Um, because it is still Christmas, one more time, I want to light the candle, reminding us of hope, peace, joy, and love, and of course, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is why many churches have uh, a white candle uh, at the front in the middle so that each Sunday they, they are reminded of the presence of Christ in their midst. Emmanuel, God with us. Aren't you thankful that we have that assurance this morning? Aren't you thankful to know that he is with us as we begin a new year, that, that uh, we do not have to go into that new year alone? Anybody remember back uh, in the year 2000, when everything was going to fall apart, when everything was going to uh, go to pieces, you know, and we were wondering if our computers were going to work the next morning or we were wondering, you know, what was going to happen. And, and here we are. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But now we're at 2023, aren't we? So we've made, it, we've made it to 2023. And we praise the Lord for that. And we thank the Lord for that this morning. As we begin, will you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And we're so thankful for the privilege of coming into your house to worship you. We're thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are gathered with us today. And ask in Jesus' name that in everything, you would just be glorified. You would just be magnified. Touch us today. Speak to us, Lord. And we will glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? And let's join in singing together. valley with my savior i would go where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow everywhere he leads me i would follow follow on walking in his footsteps till the crown be one follow
our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. You may be seated. If our ushers would come at this time this morning, the ushers for the Nazarene Church are coming. Do you have an usher this morning or ushers? Your plate will be in back for the Alliance Bible Church. Their plate will be in back after the service that you can uh, uh, contribute, you can give that way. Dear Heavenly Father, again, thank you for your blessing. Thank you for all the things, Lord, you do for us that we, Lord, just many times take for granted. The air we breathe, uh, the home we enjoy. Lord, the clothes on our back, simple things. Thank you for them. Thank you also for the privilege of giving to you through our tithes and our offerings. Take it and use it to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
week before the offering or after the offering of Lions Bible, um, Pastor Ruben asked a question. Uh, do you have any blessings you want to share? Or anything you're praising the Lord for this morning? I also ask that of our congregation. Do you have anything you're praising the Lord for this morning? Don't all speak at once. Glad to be here. I'm glad you're here too. Praise the Lord. Safe travel and glad to be home. Amen. Think you're better again. Well, praise the Lord. We're glad for that too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. I think that's, yeah. Amen. Thank you for that example. Say a little for that. Somebody else, something you're praising the Lord for. Yes, ma'am. good news on Christmas day plus one on Monday because we celebrated our Christmas on Monday my little granddaughter came out and she had a t-shirt on and it says Santa gave me the gift of being a big sister <laughs> which means my uh, son and daughter-in-law are expecting their second child in July and I'll be a grandfather twice wow I'm trying to catch up with you I got a long way to go but for them. Yeah, that's right, you know, with, with some others. But uh, thankful for that, and pra praise the Lord for that. Any, any, anyone else, anything you're praising the Lord for this morning? Yes, ma'am. Amen. Yep, praise the Lord. Yep, thankful you still have Tom, 34 years. That's great. We have a lot to thank him for as we go into the new year. Let's stand again and sing some more together. I love to tell the story. Let's start off with the chorus. I love to tell the story. Yes. 
morning, as a church family, we want together to celebrate communion, to celebrate the fact that Jesus not only came as a babe in a manger, but that he came and walked among us and then died on the cross. Uh, I've told you before, one of my favorite Christmas scenes is the scene of the manger with the cross behind it. Because there's always that in mind as we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate the cross and celebrate the fact that Jesus came and died upon the cross for us. And so this morning, we want to share together in communion. As we do, we're going to do it a little differently this morning. Uh, we're going to ask you to come, but uh, Brother Glenn and Brother Reuben are going to come and stand on one side, and uh, Bill and Judy Cutler are going to come and stand on the other side, and in a few minutes we'll ask Judy to come and retrieve the elements. Ask you to hold on to them till everybody's been served and gets back to their seats, and then we'll partake together uh, in the unity of the body of Christ. But I remind you this morning, the Lord himself ordained this holy sacrament. He commanded his disciples to partake of the bread and wine in this, of his broken body and shed blood. I remind you that it is his table. The feast is for his disciples. Let all those who have with true repentance forsaken their sins and have believed in Christ unto salvation draw near and take these emblems and by faith partake of the life of Jesus Christ Let us, let us remember that it is the memorial of the death and passion of our Lord, also a token of his coming again. Let us not forget that we are one at one table with the Lord. I'm going to ask those who are going to help me serve to come at this time. And Brother Reuben, if you would come to this table.
Heavenly Father to come and live. We ask you to take these elements of the bread and the cup. Make with us, Lord, what you would have them to be. Remind us of the wonderful gift of salvation. that our Lord was betrayed. He took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do as many of these to me. 
Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which was poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your grace and tender mercy gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer upon the cross for us. Hear us, we pray. Grant that as we receive these, your emblems, the bread and the wine, according to what Jesus said, that we may be partakers of the benefit of his atoning sacrifice. We come before you now in true humility and faith as we partake of this holy sacrament through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. I ask you now to take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you blameless into everlasting life. I now ask you to drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and you come partake and you eat this. <coughs> we want to go to prayer again. As we do, we want to remember the needs of our church family. Remember those that are sick, those that are struggling, especially ask that you remember Russ and Larry Powell in prayer. Uh, remember others that are having surgery. Any specific requests? Pastor Jeff. Jeff Smith is... Um, to see the surgeons on Tuesday to assess whether or not he would receive uh, a needed piece of equipment to be inserted. If that, if he doesn't qualify, uh, there's nothing they can do. So it's, um, it would be end of life issues for Jeff. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning. So thankful for the privilege of prayer this morning. Thankful, dear Heavenly Father, that we can start off a new year in your presence, singing praises to you, remembering what you've done for us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, remembering the wonderful gift of salvation. Thankful for your thankful for strength that you've given us and knowing dear lord as we go into a new year that we're not going in our own power and might we're going in yours and we trust you for that this morning and we thank you for that and we praise your name for it we pray that you would be with the needs as we have mentioned pray that you would be with our church family lord and just bless and work in their lives you know those who would love to be here today but cannot because of physical issues. Touch me, pray, in Jesus' name. Keep your hand upon them. We pray for our community this morning. We pray for those that are struggling, those that are struggling to put a roof over their head, those that are struggling, dear Lord, to put food on their table. And we pray that you would help us to remember that you have blessed us, not, Lord, so that we can hoard it ourselves, but so that we might give to others. Help us to share your love. Help us to share your grace with those we come in contact with, Lord. Be with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Keep your hand upon them. Work in your church, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Father, there's no one we need more than you. Jesus, you're our everything. 
As we come together today, we pray for a holy boldness that will be given to us from on high by your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would bathe us with the truth and with that truth, the confidence that was born out of that truth. Father, that we may hold to your promises in the darkest of our hours, in the strangest of times. Father, that we might hold to your word. And in that word, Lord, may we find consolation, may we find courage, may we find compassion. Father, I pray for our community. So many living in darkness and never the once they think of it in that way. Father, they need our message. They need the message of Jesus Christ. So many, Lord, unwilling to come to him for life. But Lord, there are those who are willing and may we reach out to them, I pray. Father, make this the year when we invite someone into the family. Lord, inviting them in that we might see the glory of God manifested in their lives, I pray. Father, I thank you for this congregation. And Lord, I pray that as together as we work for the kingdom, Lord, that we will do those things which will hasten the return of Jesus, our Savior, that the Lord Almighty would find his place there at the Father's throne and hear the words, go get the children. Lord, may we hear those words soon, I pray. Father, bless our time, but Lord, also make us a blessing, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. abiding peace is in my soul today. Yes, I feel it now. Yes, I feel it now. He has taken all my doubts and fears away.
Greetings from Richmond, Indiana. 20 years ago, I was driving east on Route 70, and it was a Sunday morning, and I thought to myself, what a great time to go to church. And so I called the telephone number of a local Alliance Bible, uh, the Alliance Bible Church, and lo and behold, there was a man who was folding bulletins by the name of Brian. Some of you know who he is. Well, he told me that uh, I needed to get off at the next exit, which was exit 148, and take it right straight through the parking lot of a, gr of a, uh, of a uh, grocery store and then turn left. Well, I did exactly that. As I pulled up, I saw the smallest church building I had ever seen in my life. I went in and sat down, and as I sat in that place, uh, lo and behold, Brother DeLynn came in and told us that the pastor that they had called uh, had declined the offer, and halfway through the Sunday school class, they asked me what I did for a living. I said, you're a church without a pastor. I'm a pastor without a church. So 20 years ago, in the month of March, that's how all, that's my introduction to Richmond. But Richmond's known for many other things. Founded by two Quakers from North Carolina by the name of John Smith and Jeremiah, Mac, uh, Jeremiah Cox, they settled on the gorge cliff of the Whitewater River. Now, in 1815, it became, <laughs> this is hard to imagine, a bustling trading center. I wasn't there, so I can't deny it. It was incorporated in 1818. A bridge over the Whitewater River was built in 1836, making possible the further western expansion of the nation on the National Road, now known as US 40. The city's location on the National Road and ready access to water power guaranteed its early growth, especially in the Whitewater Valley Gorge. Music has played a major role in the city's history. Star Piano became a respected instrument maker and Gannett Recording attracted top musicians to its sound studio. Hoagie Carmichael, Jelly Roll Morton, sounds like a donut shop to me, and Bix Biterbeck are just of the few of the musicians that made Richmond the cradle of recorded jazz. The city is known as the Rose City. E.G. Hill started a floral business that eventually included 34 acres under glass. Hill's Floral Company became internationally known for developing new hybrids and for growing, importing, and distributing wholesale roses. That's what you need to know about Richmond. Well, you probably are thinking, I already knew that. Well, I didn't know much about Richmond. In fact, my introduction, if you know the path 148 to Needler's Grocery Store, it's not real pretty. Okay, I mean, just coming down there, you pass all those various things. And so, but then on the way out, I went through the bigger part of Richmond and I stopped at Golden Corral, which was just opening. And my heart said, Lord, if you want me to be here, I'd like to see somebody I know. And over there by the drink station sat Chad and Sheila and Larry. And I remembered him from playing the drums. Not Larry, but Chad. And so I took that as a sign that maybe the Lord wanted me here. Well, let's turn now our minds to Thessalonica, a city that has much more history than Richmond. Uh, it's 10 times, 11 times older than Richmond. It has over 1 million inhabitants in its metropolitan area, and it's the capital of the geographic region of Macedonia, the co-capital with the uh, reigning city of Constantinople. It's one of those cities that has kept its identity from the Hellenistic era to the present day. Now, some of you may have even visited 
this particular city. The Macedonian king who founded Thessalonica named the city after his wife. That sounds like a pretty good gift, doesn't it? Under Roman rule, Thessalonica functioned as one of the most important cities in the empire, having both a vast harbor and prevalent location along a major trade route. Now, it had things going for it, just like Richmond has things going for it. But what it didn't have was knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Paul had received a vision. He called it the Macedonian vision. And he was told that he needed to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people who were deep into other religious paths. And I want to pick up the story in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. And it says there, Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now that could be 14 days or 27 days. We don't know how long. Explaining and giving evidence from the Christ, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. He came with a new message. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. His audience, Jewish, because they found themselves in a synagogue, but not only Jews. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. But the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men have upset the world, have come here also. These people who have turned the world upside down, they're in our midst. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who had heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Isn't it amazing what money will do? <laughs> uh, things haven't changed. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Now, mind you, he's in Thessalonica for three Sabbaths. And on those occasions, he's in the synagogue preaching to Jews, to God-fearing Greeks, and prominent women. And what happened was that in that time period, some of them believed. That's amazing. Some of them got agitated. Some of them got jealous. Some of them got even. Some of them got rid of Paul. But the beauty of all of this is found in the fact that this happened on the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And the writing of 1 Thessalonians happens between the second missionary journey and the third missionary journey. Less than a year would pass, and Paul is already writing to this young church in Thessalonica that hadn't had a witness of Jesus Christ before those three synagogue days, those three Sabbath days. And so let's look at this. Sometime later, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of, Thessal of the Thessalonians and God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Um, how many churches we got in Richmond? I know when I came, I, I heard that there was 100 churches in Richmond. But do you know how many churches there are really in Richmond? There's one church. There is one church. So when Paul wrote to the church of the Thessalonians, he could very well be writing to the church of Richmond. Because we like our buildings. Don't we have a beautiful building here today? It's a beautiful church. 
building. That's one of the things I learned down south is that the building is not the church. The building is the place where the church meets. Are you with me on that? So when people come and talk to me at pickleball night, you've got a beautiful place here. You've got a beautiful church. I'm thinking, have you met some of the people? Because you're absolutely right. There's some excellent people in, in both of our congregations, and I would love for you to meet them. Maybe you already know some of them, but the church is not the building. These people didn't have a building, and they would go from house to house. They were at Jason's house when they were looking for him. Three weeks. Let's look at the passage. A story of excellence. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and your labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren beloved by God, his choice of you. <laughs> now what's amazing about this is Paul is a superlative kind of guy. You know what that means? That means he, he maybe goes overboard. He uses words like always. Maybe some of you husbands have heard that verse. You always leave your underwear on the floor. And you're thinking to yourself, no, I don't. I don't always. He says, we give thanks to God always for you. I mentioned Jeff Smith and the situation that he finds himself in, and one of the daughters wrote to me on Facebook, and, or a messenger, and she said, remember my daddy in prayer, and I said, I haven't stopped praying for him. I'm always praying for him. When he comes to mind, I lift up a prayer. And I believe that's what Paul is saying about these people. As every time the Holy Spirit lays these people on his heart, he is lifting them up before the Lord. And he says, constantly bearing in mind. I, I mean, I can't, get you, I can't get you out of my head. I mean, you are so precious to me. I only was with you for three weeks. But we saw something happen there that's going to change everything. It's changing your life, and it's changing your neighbor's life, and it's changing your the guy down the street's life. In fact, everywhere we go, we hear the story how you are making an impact. You are an excellent church. Now, that doesn't mean they're perfect, because there is no perfect church. The old rule is, if you ever find a perfect church, don't join it. Because you just ruined it. All right? But an excellent church is one that is pursuing the Christ they proclaim. And here it is as we look at this story. Paul sets a model of gratitude and optimism. He has a positive outlook. And I've never heard your pastor say a negative word about you. And I don't think he's ever heard me say a negative word about my people because we're not in this to tear each other down. We're in this to build each other up. And God forbid that among the congregation there are those cases when we begin talking in an ill manner about someone else in the church. God forbid that. Because we need to be building one another up. Because there is a time coming when the church will be all that we can depend upon. And I don't know how far away that day is. But I tell you this right now. We need to be like Barnabas was to the Apostle Paul. The son of encouragement. Thank you. The son of encouragement. The one who's lifting up rather than tearing down. The one who uses words to lift other spirits and help people around them focus on God's goodness and the many gifts he's, uh, he's already bestowed on them. Paul wouldn't know them very deeply. I mean, how, how well can you know somebody in three weeks? 
I mean, some of you are still living with a spouse or have a girlfriend or, or, you know, there's some significant person in your life, and you're still learning things. That's okay. That's all right. But what you do know is that there are times in your lives when, when these people are going to need that positive word. Now, mind you, there was a transition in their life. They went from being a God-fearing Greek to a God-loving Greek. They went from being prominent women to being women of Christ. He knew that they were spiritual babies when he left them and that they would face many persecution, temptations, and spiritual attacks. He knew he wouldn't be able to be with them personally, so he left doing the only thing he could could do for them, and that was to constantly go before God's throne and beseech the Father directly on their behalf. And listen, the one thing you can do for your fellow believers in this church and in this town is to lift them up in prayer. You can't always be there, but you can lift them up in prayer. They're reminded, Paul spoke, spoke of their work of faith. Real faith drives us to work to serve God wholeheartedly, to reach for God's standards. True belief in God will push us to work for him with our brief days on earth before we enter eternity. You know, I used to to think I'd live a long time, but the time's running out. How many of you know my time's running out? You know that. I know that. But what am I going to do with what I have left? Can I bank on everything I've done as being sufficient? Or should I pursue righteousness and holiness and the purpose God gave me right up to the very end? Please be with me on this. Also, it mentions their labor of love. Real love is not easy, and it doesn't come naturally. Our natural inclinations are selfish. It takes hard work for men to support their families. It takes hard work for women to take care of the household. It takes hard work for a couple to show the proper respect and care for each other. It takes hard work to properly raise and discipline one's children. It takes hard work for a child to care for an elderly parent. Love is laborious. There's labor involved, but it's all worth it. It's all worth it. Another element of excellence he mentions his steadfastness of hope. Paul commends the Thessalonians for being steadfast. What is their hope? Their hope is this. All of Christ's promises to believers are true. I I, I was awake a good portion of the night last night. Probably more than I've ever been awake in my life, unintentionally. But as I was thinking about the promises of God, I want to believe, the pro- not that the promises of God are true, that God's promises, God's true promises are of God. Okay? God's promises don't become true, they are true. And so I have to believe that. And one of the other things that this verse says, verse 4, look there. Beloved by God, his choice of you. Every believer is chosen by God. Next time. You're feeling down. Remember this. God chose you. 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 Next time your brother or sister is feeling down, remind them, hey, God chose you. Uh, I've been encouraged to give 13 statements, 12 statements for the year. And my my first statement for the month of January is this. You ask me how I'm doing. I hope to respond, I am blessed. Okay? I'm blessed. Because to many people, that would be like, what do you mean by you're blessed? Woo! You open the door. I get to talk about Jesus. 
right? You opened that door. Or you might be able to say, next month, I'm delighted, or I'm joyful. Instead of just saying, I'm fine, you know, because that's, that's a statement with a sentence end, a, a period. But I'm blessed kind of like has a semicolon with it, and you can take it further. Now, let's look at the next part, example. For our, can you help me out there, brother? For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Some places, like this place right here, it's very easy to preach in. You know why? Because you're an audience that chose to be here. You came here to hear a message. And it makes it a lot easier for the messenger. But imagine, if you will, you show up unannounced to a Jewish synagogue to talk about a Jesus who's the Messiah, far different than what was expected, and to the Greeks, not even a clue, and you begin talking about Jesus to them. One of the things that I love about Paul is what he says to us in Romans chapter 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I came 20 years ago with high, high, high expectations. We were going to take Richmond by storm. <laughs> I think the storm fell on us. It hadn't happened the way. I, I am so shocked by this, by what God did with three weeks of services, how that he built this huge church that deserved an entire two letters to be written to them to help us understand what God was doing. Paul will easily say, it's not my oratorical method. It's not the wisdom that I possess. It's the power of God that did all this. Mind you, you may not know the right words, but if you know the right truth, you can say that to anyone. And if what you tell them that Jesus is Lord and if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, guess what? God can use that to bring people to salvation. Well, we should do our best to present it clearly. The best arguments in the world cannot, will not convince anyone to believe. Although Paul was one of the greatest preachers of all time, he was very aware that his words could not change people's hearts. That responsibility belonged to the Holy Spirit. John 16, 8, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So how could Paul, in three weeks at Thessalonica, bring about a strong and vibrant church? It seems impossible, yet it happened. How did it happen? The Holy Spirit caused it to happen. What we need to be is completely humble tools in God's hands. Never get puffed up about our amazing gospel presentations. I think one of the reasons why I was so uneasy in my sleep last night is that I knew I had the honor of preaching this message to you, and I didn't think myself worthy to bring this message because of my history, and I haven't had that great experience of having built a huge church. But you know what? The very thing I'm saying right now falls to my ear. It's not me who builds the church. It's Jesus who builds the church. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We should never get puffed up about our amazing gospel presentations or awesome answers to challenging questions. At the same time, don't fret that your skills are inadequate or your answers juvenile. We give you a passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, 
When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. God's saying through that verse, it's not what you have to say, it's what I have to say through you. So if we're faithful to declare the truth about what we know and what we've experienced, God will do the rest. Working for credit or personal glory will always hinder the Spirit's work. What we need to do is soak everything we do in prayer, knowing that we cannot change people's hearts no matter how good we are at sharing should push us to our knees. Since it is the Spirit's work, why do we not spend more time beseeching God to do it? God, if you're going to build your church in Richmond, it has to be you. It can't be us. He also says in that passage, you became imitators of us. And one of the, one of the, one of the real scary things, maybe you've even heard this, you're just like your father. Right? Right? And you're going, oh, man, I wish you hadn't said that, right? Or somebody says about your kid, he's just like you. He's a rascal, you're a rascal. The idea of modeling tends to stir up a lot of good questions, such as, what if I'm not good enough? Is it prideful to declare myself as a model to others? Is it seeking credit or glory if I tell others to follow my example? Isn't it enough to have Christ as a model? Well, Paul says these people were, quote unquote, guilty of imitating him. That's not a crime. Because what Paul says, says elsewhere, he said, follow me even as I follow Christ. If you're following Christ, you can have the audacity to say to other people, follow me. If you're following Christ, you can have the audacity to say, follow me, because I'm following Christ. If modeling is fundamentally prideful, Paul would not have done it. It was intentional and well thought out aspect. He wanted those people those people he knew for three weeks, he wanted them to be as much like him as they could possibly be because he knew he was going to leave, and in his absence, he wanted them to continue on the path that he started them on. Does that make sense? Secondly, it's not necessary to be perfect to be a model. If that were true, only Jesus could be our model. Because only Jesus was perfect. Modeling must be done with the right motivations. Our motivation should be to help the disciple grow closer to the Lord, not draw attention to ourselves just for the sake of attention. Pity the man who says, I've got 13,000 disciples. Well, really? How are you, how are you leading 13,000 people? Lord, just give me one. Give me two. Give me three. While Christ is the perfect model, he is not someone which we can see right now in front of us. Sometimes it's helpful to see a believer facing the same problems or situations as we are in so that we can learn from their examples and experiences. It's good to have Brother Delin and Sister Diana in our midst because we get to watch, I'm taking your word, we get to watch their dance of grace as they live through their situation. Thank you for modeling for us. And all around this room, there are people who are watching you to see how you live out your life. Because if they're to understand who Jesus Christ is, you're going to be the first person to let them in on what that is.
Thirdly, modeling challenges us in our own spiritual walk. Spurgeon said that before reproducing, we should consider if we want to reproduce other Christians like we are. Okay. If I'm going to ask you to be like me, then I better like me the way I am. Or at least like me the way I'm headed. Because if I don't like me as a Christian, why would I want you to be like me? Generally, people you teach or disciple will become much like you. Do you give up discipleship because of your own mistakes? and Instead, correct those issues. And you know what? One of the best things you can do in modeling is that when you blow it, you stop, admit it, humble yourself, repent, and do it in front of the people that you've done it in front of. So they know that you're human and you need God's help. Evangelistic, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. <laughs> it has a bunch of, bunch of new babies. But man, are you making an impact? I haven't been with you in months. And yet everywhere I go, I hear about you and what you're doing. Everybody's talking about the church in Thessalonica. It's amazing what God is doing. Steadfastness, work of love, labor of love, work of hope. <sighs> the Thessalonians became a model to others Paul was the model to the Thessalonians who in turn became an example to the believers in the whole province. That's reproduction. That's the work of everybody. It's not one person who has the gift of evangelism's job to win the town. It's all of our responsibility to share the truth. The result is, the saints in Thessalonica learned from Paul that they should be obeying the word. They learned from Paul that they should be passing it on to others. They saw Paul doing this, and so they did it too. In fact, they saw Paul face death, had to leave under the cover of night just to keep himself alive, but willing to go to that end that people would know Jesus Christ. The result was that the gospel went forth into the whole province of Greece and beyond. In verse 8, Paul says that the word of the Lord had sounded forth. It wasn't accidental or incidental. It was intentional. They meant what they said. Jesus has made a difference. When you think about all the persecutions this church faced in their own backyard from the Jewish troublemakers in their city, their dedication to spreading the word is even more impressive. They didn't have a nice setting like this. They were in the thick of it. And they were getting the job done. Now the next word is enthusiastic. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. They turn from idols to the living God. <laughs> I mean, they just walked away. Not doing that anymore. I, I mean, I don't care how much it cost me. I don't care what it means for my business. I don't care what it means for my family. I'm following Jesus. The Holy Spirit was at work. It was his power that completely transformed their lives. The entire direction and purpose of their life had been changed. Not only did they turn from idols to a living God, but they also we're waiting for the sun from heaven. And one of the things that you need to know, that if you read First and Second Thessalonians, every chapter talks about the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back again. Every chapter ends with that statement, he's coming back, he's coming back, he's coming back. 
And mind you, if there's not any incentive to live the Christian faith, it ought to be this one. He is coming back. And he will collect unto his own those that are his, and they will be forever with him in glory. Every once in a while, I think about my mother who passed away this past August, and I think to myself, Mom, what are you doing around the throne? What are you doing in heaven today? I'm so jealous. What are you doing? I don't want her to come back, mind you. I don't want her to come back. I, I have her voice on my phone. I'm glad to listen to it. And I've got pictures of her, but I want her where she is. You know why? Because that's where I want to be. I want to someday go to heaven. And as I was talking to my friends at McDonald's, you know you can talk to people at McDonald's. You don't have to just sit by yourself when you're at McDonald's. That goes for all the other restaurants in town, too. I sit with my friends. You know, I said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. You know? Nobody wants to die to get there. No, yeah, I'd rather be, I'd rather be 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, and 6, you know, just kind of raptured out. But to this point, most everybody that's gone to heaven has gone to heaven by way of a... You know what I mean? There's an err in all of our lives. It's going to happen. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. But the beauty of this is that in Christ Jesus, the judgment is not condemnation, but it's acceptance. It's acceptance. See, we always think of judgment as a bad thing. No, no, no. When God, if you were judging a car show, you wouldn't be looking at all the bad things. You'd be looking at the best car. Judgment means you're mine. I see myself all over you. You've been doing the things of hope, and you've been doing the things of love, and you've been doing this and that, and people have been listening, people have been watching, and you have made a difference. So here they are waiting for the sun from heaven. Each chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with that reference. Jesus Christ coming is the key theme in this book. We're going to be, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to say it because it's in my message. We're going to be looking at that. I don't know what you guys are looking at, but at Alliance Bible Church, we're going to be looking at that uh, first, uh, first Thessalonians. Um, I'm not stealing sheep. Okay. But the beauty of it is, there's progress in the kingdom. There's the possibility that I get closer to Jesus every day. And as I get closer to Jesus every day, I can bring people along in my wake. The key lesson in this chapter is that they didn't waste the time, did passively waiting for the second coming. They were growing. They were rejoicing. They were following Paul's model. They were modeling the life of a growing disciple. They were spreading the word. Their lives had been transformed, and they were showing it. And the question is, what's showing in your life? This is the question I ask at the end of the slide. What kind of church do we want to be? Now, mind you, I know we're two congregations, but that's not what I'm talking about. What kind of church do we want to be? Do we want to be like the Thessalonians who, having heard about Jesus for three weeks, took it and ran and became a missionary force in the world, covering acreages, thousands of miles with the gospel message. Can that really happen? Yes. When we bathe it in prayer, depend upon the Holy Spirit, and are faithful to the trust that's been given to us. Permit me to remind you of the response recorded in Acts 17. Some were persuaded, some were jealous, some antagonized, some loved the world more than Jesus, we cannot control a person's reaction, nor can we anticipate their acceptance or their rejection. But rest assured, where there is no invitation, 
there will be no response. If you throw a party, you better let people know there's a party going on. Or don't be disappointed that nobody shows up. And sometimes, even when you try to, your best to promote the party, still, people won't show up. But you have to do your part. And trust God to do his. What type of church do we want to be? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the honor of declaring your word today in the company of these excellent people who have so much going for them, who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who have walked that walk. And Lord, I pray that we might become people of prayer and we might be Holy Spirit-led people to understand that there is a world out there that's looking to be invited into the kingdom of God. Yes, there'll be those who reject, there'll be those who make fun, and there'll be those, but Lord, there are some out there who are dying to learn about Jesus. Help us to give voice to our faith. Help us to give labor to our love. Help us to give steadfastness to our hope. Help us, Lord, to be constant and always as we live out our faith in Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Well, I don't know what you're going to take from this, but what's the, I'm going to say, how are you doing? And you say, I am blessed. Okay? Semicolon. I am blessed. How are you doing? All right. I'm not going to make you do it three times because that's just those old preacher things. But be a blessing. Be a blessing to someone. Talk about your faith. Be the shepherds that God wants you to be. Talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. You know, I, every day I woke up, I thought about that message. You know, sometimes, so this, isn't this really sad? Sometimes somebody asks us, what did you preach last week? And you go, oh, man. You know, and you feel bad as the preacher not being able to remember what you preached. And you expect your people to remember what you preached. We're all shepherds. We know the story of Jesus. It's what we need to make known. Go to the marketplace. Go to the synagogue. Go and tell that they might come and see. John chapter 5, verse 40 says they are willing to come to him so that they may have life. If there are those who are unwilling to come, then there must be those who are willing. That's our verse for the year, John 540. Come to me so that you may have life. God bless. Father, go with us now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.